is the Deputy Executive Director for Policy at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and she's responsible for the strategic financial planning and management of all the money that MTC uh, receives. Um, she's also in charge of the legislative advocacy and public affairs and community outreach, and she's also in charge of planning um, on the MTC side, um, as for the long-range regional transportation and land use plan for Plan A area. She joined MTC in 1998, and she's had numerous positions in MTC uh, before she was promoted to be uh, Deputy Executive Director. She is a registered professional engineer in California, and she holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in public policy, both from the University of uh, both are from the University of California at Berkeley. So, Alex, did you want to go first on your introduction? Great. Please join me in welcoming Alex. roughly a 25% um, increase in population and um, households um, between now and 2040, and also about a 17 increase in employment by 2040, and that's for the whole Bay Area region. Um, for Marin County, um, I think many of you have looked at some of the materials already this morning, the scenarios project um, anywhere um, that the county would take one to two percent of the region's population, housing, and employment growth over that period. Um, plan Bay Area 2040 will also set forth a transportation investment plan for just under $300 billion. So again, we're kind of in the middle of the process. Last spring, uh, we took initial public input as we kicked off the update um, of the plan. Um, the public input helped to shape 13 um, goals and performance targets that both the MTC and ABAG uh, boards approved last fall. Um, those goals areas included uh, climate protection, adequate housing, healthy and safe communities, open spaces and agricultural preservation, equitable access, economic vitality, vitality, and transportation system effectiveness. Um, since that time, we um, have, in co collaboration with the County Congestion Management Agencies, and in this county, that's the Transportation Authority for Marin, solicited transportation projects that would help with key mobility challenges um, in the counties and in the region. Um, we've also assessed the performance of those transportation projects against the performance targets and the goals um, that we have established. Um, we've also prepared regional forecasts um, for jobs, population, housing growth, travel demand, and also revenue forecasts. And um, in addition, we've developed three alternative scenarios, which hopefully you've read about a little today. Um, one's called Main Streets, one is called Connecting Neighborhoods, and another is called Big Cities. Um, the purpose of the scenarios is to test different visions, land use patterns, transportation policies, um, and transportation projects. Um, 
we are seeking your input on the scenarios now, uh, recognizing that we aren't necessarily going to end on one of those scenarios. We really would like to take sort of the, the best input as we hear from, from you, uh, from other stakeholders, from local jurisdictions, and craft a preferred scenario and transportation investment strategy um, for the region. Um, and with that, MTC and ABAG would hope to adopt that preferred scenario this fall. Um, we definitely value the input uh, that we're going to hear today. Um, and again, once we do adopt a preferred scenario, that would kick off the environmental review and analysis of the preferred scenario as well as some alternatives and eventually culminate in the adoption of Plan Area 2040, which is uh, scheduled for next um, summer, so the summer of 2017. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of the roadmap, and uh, I will um, turn it over to Brad after we're at 37. Great, thank you very much, Alex, for your presentation. Um, about the process and about what uh, comments they've made. Brad Paul um, actually lives in Marin County, and he is Deputy uh, direct, Executive Director for um, the Association of Bay Area Governments. And he actually started working for ABAG in March of 2013, just as in the heat and the controversy of Plan Bay Area in 2013. He's in charge of the communications department and he works very closely with planning and research and development um, at ABAG and also on governance issues with all the committees that ABAG has. Um, he came to ABAG with an extensive background in community planning, development, and affordable housing and philanthropy. He's worked not only in the public sector, but nonprofit and also private sectors. He has 30 years of experience in helping public and private entities address economic, social, and political issues that are challenging cities and neighborhoods. He served as San Francisco's Deputy Mayor of Housing for Mayor Art Agnos from 1988 to 1992. So he also, as you can see, has quite a bit of political experience. Brad, would you like to come up and, and talk about ABAG's um, perspective and role with regards to Plan Bay Area? Let's welcome Brad. Is this, can people hear me? Um, thank you, Pat, for that introduction. And listening to all the things you said I did reminds me of my wife likes to say that I've worked in every sector of the economy except the military. <laughs> and she won't let me do that until my son graduates from college. Um, I just want to echo what Alex said, that this is, we're in the middle of the process, but in many ways, we're in the most important part of the process, which is going from the three scenarios you see out here in the workshop we're talking about today, to the preferred scenario, which is the one we want to go forward with, with your help and your input. Um, in Plan Area 2013, as Pat said, I joined the conversation very late in the first process for Plan Bay Area. It was the first time any of us at ABAG or MTC or in the community were engaged in a Plan Bay Area. And those of you, and many of you who were here then, remember that it got to be quite contentious, not just in Marin, but in other places. And we learned a lot from that process at ABAG and MTC. And as Pat said, the ABAG delegates in Marin helped put together a list of things that went well, which I think was one page, and a list of things that didn't go well, which I think was two and a half pages or one. And so we sat down and said, how can we do it differently? How do we get people involved earlier on in the process and give them the information they need to help us make these critical decisions? And so we're now at the point where I think we are at one of the most important moments in that process, and that's what we're here to listen to you talk about later today. And that is, where do you see Marin County going in the future? And more importantly, where do you see your individual cities and towns in the county going? How can we meet the goals we have as a region working with communities from the ground up at the local level to do the things we all want to do to make this a better place to live. In terms of my background, as Pat said, I moved here in 2006 to Sausalito and rented a house there. I bought a house there. We moved in 2010 to Green Bay, and just this summer we bought a house in San Rafael. So I'm very familiar with this. Later on the agenda, I'll be speaking again about some of the specifics and the scenarios and I'd be happy to the extent I can to take it down to the city and town level 
in terms of the work we're doing. But for now, I just want to welcome you here, echo what Alex said, that we are really here to listen. We're going to have a couple more presentations, particularly by Cynthia, who several people have mentioned to me before we started. Cynthia has been great at helping explain to people what the forecasts are about, what they mean, and unlike most people, she'll go back and tell you about the previous forecasts we've done and how accurate they were. And that's one of the most interesting parts of her presentation. So I'm going to stop now and give this back to Pat, and we will be here to answer questions for you. Thank you very much, Brad. Let's give Brad a round of applause. And uh, I have to tell you that um, Brad is slowly moving north. He doesn't know this yet, but at some point I know he will be coming to the mall. <laughs> I hope so anyway, but his house uh, in Centerville looks gorgeous. I did fail to um, introduce the most important person, and that is a Dane Sterling. Dane, uh, could you raise your hand? He's the facility manager here for the Cordomanera Community Center. Let's give him a round of applause for all of us. for us to um, ask any questions or any comments on this introductory comments and I'm going to ask John Reed to be the roving mic on the one side of the room and then Sashi McEntee. Sashi, if you want to come on over. Sorry, just testing the mic. Does this work? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. And Sashi's over here. So if you raise your hand, we need to make sure that the question is succinct. We have limited time. And also, we are going to be recording the questions down on flip chart paper. So if your question is not accurately reflected, feel free to go up and talk to the person who wrote it up on flip chart. The other flip chart is going to be made for comments. So John will start, uh, Sashi will start with you first. And my question and you can stand up and state your name. My name is Alex Gosh. And my question is a general one. Um, are we on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. So, so the future is 25 years from now, but it's a good thing to try and predict. And our experts who predict that every vehicle on the road will be electric, there also will be solar panels on everybody's roof, charging these electric vehicles overnight. The suburbs will be generating excess electricity to power cities in the future. There's a very good study on that as well. So think, dwelling on that future, including the autonomous vehicle future, why are we dwelling on a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions when it's going to happen anyway? <coughs> we should abandon this SB 375 governing this whole plan right now and start talking to national experts how we're going to be in 2040. Okay, thank you very much for your question. So the question is, why are we focusing the plan on greenhouse gas emissions when, in fact, there are electric vehicles which are going to not be emitting greenhouse gas reductions? John. And then also the comment, make sure that you record it, um, is that um, uh, uh, SB 375 should not just be focused on greenhouse gases. Either Brad or Alex. How is this? Better. Um, so in terms of one part of your question about autonomous vehicles, uh, we definitely agree that we need to be looking more at that as part of our future. It's a tough one to look at right now. So we do have um, sort of on, uh, we have a bench of sort of experts, I guess, in the futurist area that are starting to look at that question a little bit more. What, what can we expect from autonomous vehicles and how should we um, really be considering that for mobility in the future. Um, so we're kind of in the early stages, but we definitely agree that that is something we need to be looking more at. Obviously, we're kind of in the home of uh, Silicon Valley and a lot of uh, sort of hotbed of uh, what's going on. So we really are trying to look more at that. Um, in terms of electric vehicles, we do, um, you know, as part of our work, we do have to work closely with the California Air Resources Board, and they do make certain assumptions about when um, fleets will turn over in electric vehicles, and, and we do have to kind of abide by that, but I, I do hear uh, your, your point. Brad, did you want to add anything? 
Uh, just quickly, I think, and I think Cynthia will touch on this, but if we did a plan for 2040 and just put it on the shelf and said this is the plan, then we'd be in big trouble. But we keep looking at MTC and ABAC. We have analytical and research teams that each year are checking the information, upgrading or updating the projections and the forecasts. And it will change. We have to redo this every four years. So this is just a snapshot of what we think is going to happen between now and 2040, but really looking at it from the perspective of now. And the next one that's coming out in 2017 will be different and take advantage of what we've learned since the last one. And there'll be one after that. There'll be one four years after 2017. And we will keep looking at these kinds of issues and see if we need to adjust the amount of credit we give to electric vehicles, to self-driving vehicles, to solar panels each time we redo this. And often in between the, the four-year cycles and the two-year interval, we do a check-in to see how our numbers are looking after just two years of implementation of the last one. So we will keep looking at those things. So, John, you want to uh, have a question asked on your side? Follow on. Right. Follow on from that very, sorry, follow on question for that scene. Follow up. Thank you, John. David Kuhnhardt, Corte Madera, 100 year old Corte Madera next week. Uh, I wanted to reflect that the goal number one on the list of goals is, is dramatically unambitious uh, at 15% reduction of per capita CO2 emissions. And the reasons are as follows. According to the uh, California Air Report, or Air Resources Board, about 40% of California's uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. Uh, last year, we tried to pass SB 350 uh, on three different topics. We, talked, we passed two out of the three. The, two that got, the third that didn't get passed was reducing our uh, use of fossil fuels in transportation by 50% by 2030. 50% reduction by 2030. It is possible and it is a feasible goal and it is absolutely a desired and necessary goal for us to step up Saying 15% by 2040 is just dramatically unambitious, and we've got to get better. This is the biggest issue that faces us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Address that comment at all? It was just a comment, so I don't have a response. So as long as we've noted that comment, thank you very much for your comment. Sashi, do you want to do one on your side? Thank you. And then, John, have somebody queued up on your side for a question. There's an important link with this planning process to regional transportation funding. And as you know, Marin suffers from significant regional bypass traffic every afternoon. Can you describe that uh, planning with the regional funding formula and the status of future funding for transportation in Marin County. Alex, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think that, um, you know, when we put together this plan, we are required to make our plan financially constrained. So we have to look out over 25 years and try to estimate what we think the available transportation revenues will be. So we have done that for the region. Um, and it sounds like a lot of money, 300 billion, but I think uh, the point that Linda's raising is that it's woefully inadequate to probably meet all of the, the important transportation needs that we have. Um, we basically go through a process where we try to look at what it's going to take to maintain the system that we have, the streets and roads infrastructure, the highway infrastructure, the transit infrastructure. We look to put as much of the money immediately to that that we can, recognizing that we really need to maintain the system that we have. Um, then we also look at all the important uh, projects, uh, whether they be local uh, bikeway projects that are important, whether they're important uh, interchange improvements, or um, obviously, uh, you know, a big one right now are the improvements to the Richmond Santa Fe Bridge, but we look at those sort of for the future, what are those types of projects, and then we look at the available revenues after that and look at what are the most uh, important high performing projects against some of our targets, what are some of the most important projects for the local communities and we put together an investment strategy and that's really part of what we want to hear from you on, get your input and then try to uh, also adopt that in the fall. I don't know that I can speak exactly to formulas, um, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of how the revenues uh, work. 
Brad, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, just that we moved our offices from uh, the Lake Merrick Bart Station area to San Francisco, and so before we did that, I drove the Richmond Center Fell Bridge every day. So I'm aware of some of the funding needs and some of the things that are moving forward, but I think that's an important issue that both ABAG and MTC are looking at as we go forward. Great. Thank you, John. Can you um, have, do you have someone queued up on your side? Thank you. Cindy Winter Greenberg, to the question about spontaneous, um, excuse me, autonomous cars, I'd like to add ride-sharing apps because they are happening now. The autonomous cars are coming later. And the ride-sharing apps have the promise of reducing traffic on our roads. They will reduce traffic in parking lots and in parking garages. You probably know more about this than I do, but I wanted to make sure it was on your list. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your comment. We have time for two more questions. Um, Masashi on the side. And then, John, if you can have one more person to up. I'll do it. Um, yeah. I noticed that you have your three scenarios over there that I'm um, studying very carefully. Moving forward, when we're looking at what you're presenting, is this all or nothing for one of those three, or is there going to be uh, flexibility in coming up with an overall plan that might consider parts of the three? Alex? That's a really great question. Um, we we definitely don't envision that it's one of the three. We really envision that we get comments and we take what are the best elements of the three scenarios or maybe even a few other things that we can think about that we get as comments uh, from the public and stakeholders and local jurisdictions and then we craft a preferred. So we, we really don't see it as um, one of them um, moving forward, but rather the best elements of the scenarios. Brad, did you want to add anything? No. Okay, good. John, you have the last question on your side. I know there's other questions out there. Please write them down um, because there's going to be other opportunities to add, add, ask questions. Clay? Yes, uh, I, I think that it's all well and good to talk about the future of uh, 25 years from now. But I think it's important we don't uh, forget about the present, which is here in the North Bay. We have numerous failed road systems. Where I live Your in question. Sand Valley, I get to my question. Okay. Uh, we have a failed road system at Tam Junction. We have a failed system uh, up there at the Narrows, north where you live in Nevada. We have Highway 37, which is a complete mess. In this whole planning process, before you go on to all of these grand plans, what are you going to do for us right now? to solve these problems with the money you have available. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Uh, Brad, do you want to go first and then Alex? Okay. Or Alex first. <laughs> well, I, you know, we definitely are trying to solve problems now. We're not just looking to the future. Um, in fact, um, I was just looking at sort of the list of projects that we have in the next four years and we're in county and there's $500 million of transportation investments. One of them I mentioned, the improvements in the Richmond uh, San Rafael Bridge. Another uh, significant one being some more improvements on 101 in terms of uh, the Marin Sonoma Moneros project that we have been working very closely um, with Marin County, TAM, with Sonoma County, um, trying to, you know, find whatever revenue we can, whatever funding that we can to make improvements in that. And I understand that it's Surely not coming fast enough. Surely a billion dollars, you can find the uh, money. Uh, Clayton, Clayton, thank problem. you. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, did you want to finish up? No, I think that we are, you know, again, trying to use the limited dollars that we have as effectively as possible. We're trying to um, get these improvements made as soon as possible, because we know that for the traveling public, it's really important for their lives, so. Thank you very much. Uh, Brad, did you want to add to that? I'd just add quickly that there are members from um, Napa, Sonoma, and Marin County on both of our boards who I've heard talking about the question about Highway 37 and the things that need to be done. I drive that frequently, and depending on what time you go, it can be okay or a nightmare. So I think people are talking about these things and working on them. I don't know what the exact solution is, but I've heard that there's a lot of conversation about Highway 37 as well. 
So Brad and Alex, thank you very much. We're going to ask you to come back at the end uh, for general questions and answers um, and sit up at the panel. So thank you. Let's give it a round of applause. And if you haven't had a chance to ask a question, please note it down because there will be plenty of time at the uh, wrap-up where we're going to be able to ask some questions. At this point, I'd like to introduce um, one of the AVAG uh, representatives from the town of Larkspur, um, Catherine Way, um, who is um, currently, I believe, mayor of Larkspur. And um, she is Larkspur's representative to the AVAG General Assembly. And she's been an active participant in the Bryn AVAG Delegate Ad Hoc Committee that I formed back in um, 2012. And uh, she's been a resident of Larksburg for over 11 years. Uh, she is a wonderful person. And please join me in welcoming uh, Catherine. She's going to be introducing our next speaker. Hi, my part on the agenda today is to introduce Cynthia Kroll and then to ask a couple of questions and then moderate an open dialogue and conversation like we just did. So. Uh, this is about the forecasting models that ABAG and MTC are using. So Cynthia Kroll is the Chief Economist for ABAG. She oversees the agency's economic analysis and regional forecast. She directs agency research activity, coordinates the regional economic development efforts, and supervises a team of research professionals. Dr. Kroll has extensive experience in research and program management and has specialized in topic areas that tie economics, social and scientific knowledge to public policy. She'll have a presentation for us, come up, and then I'll follow up with two questions and then we'll open it up to all of us, just like we've done in this last segment. Here you go. So I hope that there's a tech person who's queued up here to actually get my presentation on screen. Um, one of my favorite cartoons is a Dilbert cartoon where they appoint this guy Wally to be the chief economist at the organization where he works and they appoint him because nobody understands a word he says. Now I hope that won't be what actually happens today. Today is talk a bit about our overall regional forecast because I haven't had a chance to actually uh, describe that to this audience uh, since it was adopted or accepted in January of this year. And then I'll say a little bit about the process leading to the scenarios, but also the speaker that follows me, Matt Maloney, will go into that, the concepts of the scenarios and, and more of the numbers there. And then we'll both be able to answer questions about it. So I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll first just let you know where we are in doing the projections because we finished the regional projections, but we're still very much cooking the scenarios that you've seen today. What you see today is one point in time output from our models. And then I'll talk a little bit about the process toward the preferred scenario. So we've done a lot in the last year and a half that I've been working on this. Uh, we actually went in and totally revamped the forecasting process that was happening at ABAG. We brought in new tools, demographic analysis. We have a regional model that we had to do quite a bit of adjustment to to make it a forecasting, a model that produced projections of jobs, population, and then internally beyond that model, we've done the household housing projections. Um, we also were working at the same time as we were working on the regional projections. We were already starting to talk about what the scenarios would be and what the numbers might be around them. And we, we put out preliminary regional numbers in October, preliminary scenario numbers in December, adopted the regional numbers in January, and are in the midst, really, of creating the we have the scenario numbers that are being presented to you today, but we're 
really only partway towards doing the preferred scenario. And there will be a lot of jurisdiction and stakeholder review during this process. The preferred scenario won't be adopted until the fall. So how do we do the forecast? I want to emphasize that this is very much a joint activity between our two agencies, ABAG and MTC, but we have different responsibilities. So ABAG has been responsible really entirely for the regional forecast, meaning looking at how the region as a whole will grow. Uh, MTC is responsible at the other end for doing the transportation modeling and for calculating greenhouse gas estimates as well as all the performance targets, although those performance targets were crafted with ABAG's participation as well. And then in the middle, there's this whole process of distributing the forecast to different parts of the region, and both ABAG and MTC are involved in doing that, and as you can see, the local jurisdictions are involved, the public is involved in doing that. It's in some ways kind of a messy process. Um, but one that I think is really important. So this is the first picture of, of just how complex it is. Because on the one hand, we have that circle, which is really that self-contained analytic work. But outside, there are uh, many both experts that provide assistance in the work that we do, as well as uh, advocates and um, other groups that provide either requirements for what we do or suggestions or requests. And there is a lot of back and forth. We, we've learned a lot uh, from both the technical experts that have worked with us and from these advocacy groups and other interest groups. Uh, we have some additional requirements that have been put on us uh, by some of this process. For example, our housing number is not exactly the number that we might have forecast otherwise because we're required by the Bay Area Building Industry Association to add to our housing number, housing that would be required for the people who that we forecast are actually going to be in community additional people. So that's just an example. Um, so we do our, our regional modeling, our geographic distribution, and then all the output from that and the preferred scenario then goes into the environmental impact assessment calculating the targets. So, what I'd like to get across is that there's just not one right way of doing this. And there's so much uncertainty involved that, um, you know, we're not going to know whether we have the right answer for 25 years. And I, Steve, I kid my friend Steve Levy that you know, we're going to be in the assisted living quarters in the same place we're going to sit there 25 years from now, and one of us is going to say, I was right, or more likely, <laughs> we're both going to say, oh, we were both wrong. Uh, anyway, even though we're not going to get an accurate picture of what's going to happen, I think the process is really important. Because how can you talk about what you need for the future, where growth will go, unless you've thought a lot about what the future might look like? So. Uh, these are the final uh, regional projections that we have. I put them up there uh, compared to where we were in 2010 because our projections actually go from 2010 to 2040. Now it's already 2016. So I also put up numbers for where we are in 2016 uh, because what we saw back just closely behind us in the rear view mirror, what was going on from 2010 to 2015, really led us to change from that red line, which was our projections in 20, um, back in 2013, to this goldenrod line, which is a little bit higher, uh, based on the strength the Bay Area has shown uh, in really bouncing back from that recession. But the bottom line is, compared to where we are today, we're expecting a little bit less than 700,000 more jobs in the region in the next 25 years. Perhaps 1.9 million more people. Um, that's, that would be almost 2.4 million people compared to where we were in 2010. Uh, we still have about 690,000 households to add. 
we would have added, if we reached this number, 780,000 more than in 2010, and 770,000 more housing units because we built only um, 55,000 in the last five years. So this is another way of looking at that increment of change. If you take the each stacked bar as a whole, it's showing you the total growth that we would expect from back from back in 1990 up until 2040. And but then I split that growth into two increments. What we had from 1990 to 2010, that's a 20 year period. What we had in the last five years from 2010 to 2015, and then what we're projecting from 2015 on out. And you can see it looks, that distribution of the colors is really different if you look at jobs versus population versus households and housing. Households and housing don't look that different. Um, but we've had this huge surge of jobs. We've had population growth that's gone along with that, um, but not at the same level that we had in jobs. On the other hand, we had practically no growth in jobs from 1990 to 2010, and we had substantial population growth. So we're kind of looking at, at something in between that happening going forward. We're looking at continued employment growth, but not at continuing at the rate that we've had in the last five years by any means. Uh, and we're looking at continuing population growth uh, that's generated both by the growth of people within the region and by bringing in some new people to fill those jobs uh, because many of our working age adults today in 25 years will be retired adults. And then in households, uh, we really over the last five years have been building up a lot of pent up demand, not only for housing, but for forming households. Uh, we have more multi-generational households as young adults move back and live with their parents. Uh, we have much more doubling up as young adults share quarters because they can't afford something. And eventually, um, we expect that, that to expand into more household formation, particularly if the region actually succeeds in building some more housing units. So just very briefly, uh, the kind of growth we expect in terms of employment is both a continuation of the tech and social media and the advantages that the Bay Area has had in innovative industries, but also substantial growth in services to the changing population. In terms of population growth, uh, we expect the population 65 and over to more than double, and the working age population to increase by about 30% much less of an increase percentage-wise in the school-aged population and younger. And to me, that's good news. We have a lot more uh, working adults who can help to support our schools and our education and to eventually education. The next generation that really need, is needed to keep our economy strong. And then in terms of households, we project that about three quarters of the growth in households will be in households headed by people 65 and over. And that's really important as we talk about the kind of housing that we need. And finally, to meet our housing needs, we are going to have to change our level of building activity. Now our for forecast is that employment growth is really going to slow um, by in the short term, between now and 2020, if we're right, then we have a chance to catch our breath. But if, we're, um, if it continues to grow as rapidly as it's grown the last three or four years, we're actually going to have to be building more at this, let's see, at this level, these levels, which are closer to what we were building in the 80s and 90s. Um, whereas right now, we need to make um, not quite double what we're building as a year if this forecast, short-term forecast is right. But in any case, in either case, by 2020, we're going to have to be able to much more efficiently put housing into some parts of the community. Some parts of the region, I should say. So the final points on the regional projection. Um, 
First, our employment projection does assume the region can supply enough housing to allow some additional workers to move into the area. And if it doesn't, our employment growth will either be slowed or we'll have much more incommuting from outside the region. And because we're creating a sustainable community strategy, we really have to plan for something that doesn't uh, make that happen. The household projection uh, is actually conservative in terms of household size assumptions. We're assuming that some of what people have learned to make using housing more efficient today, uh, the ways I've described it of, ha of having fitting more people into a smaller number of households will continue, uh, but not all of that. And even at this more conservative level, the, the building that we're forecasting in terms of adding new housing is quite ambitious compared to recent historic building patterns. But I want to add that I'd rather we not become totally focused on what the actual level is uh, because the projections become a plan only after there's a lot of discussion among local jurisdictions about how growth can be accommodated. And uh, not only in terms of numbers and where we put them, but also in terms of creative ways of accommodating the need for housing, which is very real. So, are we going to be right in that projection? Well, they say economists uh, know tomorrow why the things they predicted yesterday didn't happen today. Um, and I learn that every, every day. So how good are the projections? Here are the projections that were done in the past by ABAG for Marin County. First, I'm showing you employment projections. And one thing about employment is you can, you can guarantee you're going to be right part of the time during the strongest peak of the employment or the weakest trough. That may hit a number that you've projected. Uh, but, it's, but if you look at the overall trends, projections have been pretty high relative to what's actually happened in Marin. The one that I would say was much more conservative, although you may have felt it was high, but the one that was done in 2013 was actually um, below what the long-term trend is, has been for Marin County. What's coming out of those models, the model that you see on the board is much closer to the trend lines slightly above it. When we look at population growth, the projections have been much closer, although they were somewhat above what happened in the recent past 10 years. Uh, if we look at the trend lines going out, again, projections 2013 was right on those trend lines, somewhat related to the way the uh, projections were made. And what you're seeing on those boards there are those stars are kind of stretched out to give you a full range, uh, so it's at the trend line to slightly above. So, why do we, you know, what are we talking about? A trend, a range. Why don't we talk to the nearest tender? I do have a, a sense of humor, even though they say economists don't have as much personality as accountants. <laughs> All right, so I figured we needed a second cartoon this time. This one's still in the uh, creation process. But basically, distributing the projections, as I said, is a pretty messy process. Oh, and I have to move on quickly, I'm told. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but suffice it to say I have a great team. Uh, we get some input, friendly, not so friendly. We try and take all of it seriously and figure out how we can uh, really take that information into account. Now this chart I, is taking the numbers that you see over there in the workshop area, but I've, I'm couching them in a different way. So rather than the numbers from 2010 to 2040, I've looked at the growth that actually happened from 1990 to 2015, because that's a 25 year period, and I've subtracted out what we already got from 2010 to 2015, from those particular projections. And I, so what you see here is comparable next 25 years compared to the past 25 years. And this is, we're back to looking at, no, this is for, for Marine County as a whole. 
And you can see that employment is actually projected to grow more slowly than in the past 25 years. Population, depending on which scenario you look at, but even the highest scenario is adding less population than it did in the last 25 years. And yet, household growth is projected uh, to be higher. And this, again, relates to the demographic changes uh, that are going on. Uh, the housing numbers, I have to say, you have to take these with a grain of salt because the housing numbers that come out of the model, and that's what is on the boards and that's what's here, are not building enough housing to actually meet the regional housing control total. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. And in Marin County in particular, it's partly because the model in its current form is ignorant of seasonal housing. So it's saying, oh, I don't have to build housing. I'll just put more people in all of these vacation homes. Well, going forward, we try not to assume that we have to build the same proportion of vacation homes in reaching our regional housing control total, but we do uh, assume that those that are there are not then incorporated into, um, are not incorporated into this um, absorbing the household growth. So, I have one minute left. Um, I don't think I'll go into this slide uh, because of that, which is probably just as well, because that's the one where you'd say, oh, I didn't understand that economist after all. Um, so let me just wrap up. Um, so I want to emphasize that I'm really glad we had the scenarios out there to enable this discussion, but at the same point, that's what it is. Model outpoint frames the discussion, and what you're seeing today is not the total answer or what we actually will come up with as the plan. Uh, but having these out there framing it enables us to get the local input that we need that's really crucial to coming up with a final plan. This whole projections process for us is really useful because it shows possible outcomes with different sets of policies and that's one of the things we use the model for. And we'll have to continue to refine those policies and continue to gather information to shape our preferred scenario. So I want to thank all of you very much for coming and providing that input. Thank you. start teeing up with two questions for Dr. Kroll that are coming really from the concerns that the, uh, the questions that the ABAC delegates who represent all of you have been asking. The first question that um, we've been asking and concern from, from the last uh, rendition of Plan Bay Area is the inconsistency in the, um, in the projection and numbers from the different agencies like the California Department of Finance, um, the U.S. Census Bureau and others and what we had been concerned about is whether in this new rendition there is more system um, put in place to have consistency in the numbers. So we are uh, in conversation with the Department of Finance uh, and kind of the, the interchange that broke down last time was hopefully not happening this time but at the same time we may not come up with the same numbers. So for example the Department of Finance revised their numbers last time once they understood what our projections were of employment. And so for the region as a whole, their numbers became much closer to what our last forecast was, so about 9.2 compared to 9.3 million. For Marin, they were still pretty far off. And the reason was they assumed that Marin's um, Restrictions on new housing development would stay in place. We assumed that there would be, that ways would be found to increase housing construction in some parts of Marin. And so you may still see things that are not exactly the same. Okay, um, we'll keep an eye, we'll continue to keep an eye on that. Okay. Um, the other concern that, or, or issue that the Marin delegates had, and many of you got this form, uh, is that projected broad job growth forecast for Marin lists 30,000 jobs at an average to come in into Marin. And Marin um, already has some of the lowest employment in the Bay Area. 
but with job forecasts come housing demands and um, development demands. So the question is the 30,000 jobs, how um, accurate should we presume those to be? You should presume that, you see that numbers under construction? Yeah. That, that refers to the employment numbers more than anything else. But at the same time, um, look at, this is the, then the next 25 years. So that 30,000 includes 15,000 jobs that have already, 10 or 15,000, something like that, that have already been added. So now we're talking about increasing job numbers in Marin, uh, if these are right, from about the same amount in the next 25 years that have happened in the most recent five. Because looking at the projections of uh, Main Street, connected neighborhoods, and big cities, and averaging that, 30,000 additional jobs is a la very large number for Marin County. It sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Um, it? The other thing to keep in mind is that these include self-employment jobs. So in some cases, it might be growing because not only are people who are working in the regular jobs there, but people who are retiring are starting their own little small enterprises. Okay. So. All right, so I'll take it up for those two questions, and now we'll do what we did before, which is alternate, and I think Pat Microphone on this okay. side, John, and that's um, and just John, you want to go first? Would you stand up, say your name, and uh, and make sure that they're documenting what you said correctly. Thank you. Uh, since the original three count, uh, three quarter. You had to have the Sorry, thank you very much. Since the original uh, three quarter plan, 1973, Marin has delighted in confounding projections. In fact, in that plan, we. Uh, forecasted today, we have roughly 300,000 population, we have 260. It's difficult to evaluate your policies correctly unless you disaggregate. My belief is that the number of housing, the number of jobs in very low and low income categories is burgeoning in our own personal services and retail. That's exactly where the housing need is the most dire. We are generating traffic. We are in a plantation economy. And it would be good to make sure that the number of trips generated within and outside of Marin are counted because of that unjust allocation of housing. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, our, our, as I said, these models are very much are still under construction, and one of the pieces that really is is on the subsectors of employment, and so that's well, right. But as you you mentioned, the occupation types that are growing, we'll have a better idea of that as we get a better um, count of the kinds of jobs that are growing. So thank you for that input. Over here, Cynthia. Hi, my name is Bernard Catalanado. I have a question about your household growth forecast. Um, you haven't, been, I know the devil's in the details, so sometimes maybe favorite. On, on the no project, you have growth from, in Mill Valley, from 5,900 to 9,600 units. That's 3,600 units. Now, is this just a statistical blip, or do you actually have some basis for adding 3,600 units to Mill Valley? I think Mill Valley is a statistical blip, and uh, earlier versions had that happening in all the scenarios. Uh, I should explain that the, uh, the S0 scenario is the no plan, so that's also the growth that would happen if we didn't have some type of uh, regional plan in place, some of the policies in place that are being expressed. But I don't think what you're seeing in Marin Valley is just no planning versus planning. I think it's a statistical item as well. But I should mention that MTC is actually responsible for running this model. And so I am not 
as familiar in detail with exactly what's under the hood for each of these places as I would be if it were my mind. But we've had a lot of talks with them about that. I would, I would look at the, the other groups. doesn't address it and that even 
you know, these models try in some ways, but they don't fully address it. And these are questions that certainly can be discussed in the plan, and um, but also that need that discussion at the local level, as you point out. So, Pat, why don't we do one more question, and we got to get back on our time, because I know we're John? I'm not sure this quite fits in, but I think it's an overall picture. I think there's all this talk of amenities, and I think there's a bigger picture in the red, which is all ignored. It just happens to be uh, a world-class, beautiful place. And for getting people here and what their own selfish motives are, I think a big question is how do you preserve some of these places so that people all over the Bay Area, all over the country, all over the world uh, can visit. And I think that's not always looked at because people suddenly decide that people living here are selfish, let's ignore them. And you ignore, uh, ignore the broader picture that in, in many ways this county, regardless of who are the people that are living here, is a geographic place worth preserving and allowing other people to visit. And you know, when you just, when you just thoughtlessly talk about uh, whether it's a uh, plantation system, whatever it is, you're ignoring the fact of all this beauty here that's very important to people everywhere. And so I think that should impact uh, the concept of how uh, much developed here. Well, I love Marin. And we have people, as you can see, a number of people working right on this live in Marin and love it as well. Uh, part of what Plan Bay Area does is that it has a whole program of priority conservation areas as well. And Marin has a large segment of the camp in that. So uh, you know, the hard thing is, is to balance where growth should occur, what that growth should look like, what's appropriate for Marin may be very different from what's appropriate for other parts of the Bay Area. And the kind of articulating those concerns is a really important part of finding that balance. So thank you. So thank you, Dr. Cole, for that. And we're going to get back and try to stay on the schedule. Um, you know there are more questions, and there are very important questions, which is why this workshop is here. And there are a dozen um, representatives from um, ABAG and MTC here to answer your questions. And please make sure you write them down, because we need Marin to be very well represented in this process. Your uh, city and county delegates are working really hard to make sure that our voice is heard, and this is really important for your voice to be heard too. So they're here for, um, to ask questions, but I know some people's hands were raised that didn't get a chance to ask. So moving on. So uh, let's give a round of applause to uh, Catherine Lay for moderating this session. I'm so glad that, uh, that you're doing the forecast uh, for our cities. Uh, the next session is um, even more important um, and uh, is equally as important as the last one. This is a session on the three different scenarios, the performance evaluation, and a sneak peek at what's called vital signs. And the moderator for this session is Stephanie Bolton Peters, who was elected first to the um, City of Mill Valley um, Council in 2007. And uh, she's former mayor and currently serving as a city council member. She is chair of um, the Transportation Authority of Marin, which focuses primarily on uh, the transportation planning and projects and programs in our county. And she also represents the mayors and council members in Marin County on the Marin Transit District and also the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit. We all refer to it as SMART. She's a longtime promoter of walking and biking um, and is also the chair of the Mill Valley State Routes to Schools Task Force. And um, she's been a resident of Mill Valley for 20 years. And um, please join me in welcoming Stephanie Mullen Peters. So we're going to move forward on our agenda and take a deeper dive into the inner workings of Plan Bay Area, or as Cynthia just called it, what's under the hood, in terms of jobs and housing numbers and the three scenarios. So as you listen to the presentations for the speakers I'll introduce in just a moment, the things to be asking yourself is, is, is this the way we want to see the, the Bay Area grow? How do we want to see the Bay Area grow? 
So you'll hear contrasting land use and transportation scenarios. And as was said earlier, in the end, uh, the final product may be a compilation, but this is, these are three looks to stimulate thinking and comments. So uh, our speaker from ABEG will be Brad Paul again. He's been introduced, and I'm glad he can join us. And then I'd like to introduce you to Matt Maloney, who is the principal for the major projects at MTC. Matt and his colleagues are responsible for overseeing the update to the Plan Bay Area and the Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy, including the scenario development you'll hear about, project performance, and investment strategy. Matt also manages the agency's transit planning work and the Regional Goods Movement Plan. Prior to MTC, Matt spent seven years at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, where he served as Deputy Chief of Staff and managed the agency's policy development and analysis activities. He has a Master's in Public Policy from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor's in Urban Studies from Brown, and he is a resident of Marin County and lives in San Rafael with his family. So, with that, Matt, will you be our first speaker? Yeah. Great, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just going to queue up my uh, PowerPoint here. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Just let me know if you're having trouble with the, with the volume, and I'll, I'll make sort of an adjustment on the fly. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and, and to see all of the uh, interest in, in this regional planning process, which I think is really important. And, and I want to say a few more words about uh, about Plan Bay Area and kind of where we've been and where we're going. Back in 2013, we had the adoption of uh, Plan Bay Area, which was the first combined regional transportation plan and sustainable community strategy for our region. And I think it's important to recognize we've been doing these regional transportation plans, or RTPs, for a long time. Um, so these really aren't new, and, and they're really the purpose of them is to set regional priorities for a, a big, very complicated transportation system of highways and buses uh, and transit. And what was really new in 2013 was this addition of the sustainable communities strategy to this framework, where not only were we looking at transportation, but we were also consolidating that conversation with land use and housing and the environment uh, and the economy. Moreover, um, as some of you know, there's requirements that come down on us from the state uh, in terms of some of the things that we need to measure. So we heard a comment earlier about sort of the GHG and the 15% uh, per capita, and that's sort of a requirement uh, under state law. So what I want to do today is, is walk you through some of the scenarios that make up the plan update, uh, and also look at uh, the evaluation of some of these scenarios, uh, present a snapshot of some of the transportation investments, and some of the issues that we face with finding enough financial resources to maintain and expand our transportation system. And before I do that, I actually also want to briefly walk through some of the major regional trends in regards to transportation congestion, housing, and open space, which Mayor Eklund uh, mentioned, which is our vital science effort. So I won't belabor this too much. I know most people in the room sort of know what Plan Bay Area is, but I mean, a bit of a primer again. It's a roadmap to help Bay Area cities and counties preserve the character of our diverse communities while adapting to the challenges of future population growth. And I think the word roadmap is really important because at its core, this is a regional planning document. It's, it's a blueprint. Um, and so whether we're discussing issues of housing, jobs, land use, or transportation, it's important to recognize the importance of local decision making, citizen engagement in these processes. And when it comes to implementation of projects and programs on the ground, whether they're transportation projects uh, or, or development projects, uh, the details matter. Uh, and there's no one size fits all uh, across the region. And what works in places like San Francisco, Oakland, or Silicon Valley uh, are not necessarily a solution uh, for Marin. And uh, as, as staff working on this, we, we acknowledge and respect that. Nine counties is a huge geographic reach for the, for the plan. Um, while the Bay Area is truly one economy, it's connected through our transportation system. Uh, many of us live in one place, but we work or we recreate uh, in another place. Uh, the issues across these counties are very different. 
Um, I, I think the collective issue that we all face is that, and as Cynthia talked about, is that this region is projected to grow. This is a very attractive region to come and work, to raise your family. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, and people all across the country uh, and across the world uh, want to be here. Um, and when we look into the future, you know, these are big numbers, 2.4 million people and the need for 820,000 new housing units. And it's kind of an inconvenient truth. But it, again, it is sort of the reality that we see. And, and there are some places across the region that are interested in taking on some of this growth. Uh, and we also acknowledge that. I think one of the, the issues that we face as transportation and land use planners is that uh, if the places interested in this growth are very far away from job centers, it costs a lot of money to provide that transportation. And I think as Alex mentioned earlier, we operate under a plan of fiscal constraint. Um, so we try to be visionary, but we also try to be practical about the amount of revenues that we have to spend on transportation. So I want to talk a little bit about vital signs, um, which is really uh, sort of setting the stage. In, in order to do long-range planning and, and forecast and look to the future, we have to understand more about where we are now uh, and where we've been. Uh, my colleague Dave Lawton, who is standing over there, is really the architect of this project, and I'm going to show uh, some key sort of regional numbers by county that come out of Vital Signs, and then I'm going to have Dave just really quickly show you the website, um, kind of how you access it and how you use it, and then we'll move on and talk a little bit more um, about the scenario. So this Vital Signs effort, it, it, we are leading it. We're, we're leading it in conjunction with with ABAG and the Air District and BCDC. And we track regional trends across uh, transportation, congestion, housing, environment, uh, and the economy. And so I want to touch on some, some, some interesting uh, topics and, and regional trends that we see. And, and one of these issues that we track is commute times, um, how long it takes people to get to work. And, and the chart shows 1980 out to 2014 uh, by county. And, and one of the first things you'll notice is that every county in the Bay Area saw rising commute times in the calendar year of 2014. The chart is showing average commute times by county of residents. Of the North Bay counties, Marin and Solano had similar to commute times to San Francisco and Alameda residents. And Sonoma and Napa counties' commute times actually remained the shortest in the region, less than 25 minutes. And that's largely a function of, in those North Bay counties, of a lot of people uh, living in the same place uh, that they work. Um, and Contra Costa, which is the highest, sort of leading the way, um, if you will, uh, although it's a challenge for those folks, best reflects the region, the region's east-west uh, jobs housing balance. So just in terms of population, this is a bit more detail, sort of by county, in terms of um, where we've been, uh, in terms of population change. This is actually going back to the 60s, uh, looking at changes by county, 60s to 2010. And in terms of population, uh, regional growth has become increasingly concentrated in the East Bay and the South Bay. Um, North Bay is mostly slow growth. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, the two key trends in North Bay population growth uh, that I want to mention, Marin and Napa have been pretty slow growing since the 60s. Marin grew only 4,000 in the 2010s, 6,000 uh, across the 2000s decade. Uh, Solano and Sonoma have been more primary growth centers, but even then Solano's growth peaked in the 80s and Sonoma's growth was concentrated in the late 20th century. Moving on to jobs, obviously the Great Recession um, had significant impacts uh, on jobs uh, everywhere. Every county was affected by the, by the recession. This chart shows the job growth across the last three decades. And I think it's fair to say what the data showed, the North Bay saw a smaller bust compared to tech centers like Silicon Valley and San Francisco, which has been a bit of a slower recovery as well. Marin lost jobs in the 2000s, like most other places, uh, but it has rebounded to a degree uh, in this decade. So I want to touch also on, on greenfield development, sort of development in uh, open space and uh, agricultural lands. Um, you know, relative to other places across the United States, um, the Bay Area has a legacy of protecting its open space and its agricultural lands. Um, it is not necessarily a common phenomenon uh, across the region, this greenfield development. It does occur to some degree, and we wanted to point out some of that. We, we just circled really the, in terms of the colors on this map, the yellow is the 90s, the blue is 2000s, and red is, is 2010. Uh, what you'll notice is that in the North Bay, um, there's been very little uh, development 
um, at all in green fields, maybe just here or there, depending upon certain projects. Um, but most of that uh, development has been centered in uh, eastern Contra Costa uh, and Alameda counties. And as I think we all know, um, probably the biggest sort of public policy issue I think that the region faces is housing and housing affordability uh, more directly. Um, the prices here um, are outrageous, um, <laughs> I, I think, and I think you know if you've got family that live in other areas of the country, um, you know they're they're just typically amazed by what we experience out here, um, uh, and especially if you're. Um, if you're starting a family here and you've got kids and you're thinking about the future, whether your kids can actually afford to live here, it's, it, it, it's a serious issue that we all have to think about. Um, home prices do continue to surge. Um, Marin County actually used to be the most expensive housing market in the region. Uh, that is no longer the case. San Francisco has moved into that uh, top spot, uh, fueled by the tech boom uh, and, and some of the, the resiliency to the Great Recession. Uh, single family house, condo, or townhome median level 2014 in San Francisco is close to a million dollars. Uh, in Marin and San Mateo are sort of tied for a second, if you will, if it's a competition, which I'm not sure it is. Um, but Marin does remain the second most expensive, and down sort of at the bottom, Solano home prices are one third of those in San Francisco, making it the most affordable of the nine Bay Area counties. And I think you know, one thing that you understand about this is that if there's affordable housing sort of on the outskirts of the region and there's demand to be out there that affordable housing it causes an incredible strain on our transportation system um, in terms of the capacity that we have to create. And that really kind of sums up what we try to do in planning in a nutshell, transportation and land use. I mean, the other thing that comes down upon us is they say, well, you've only got a certain amount of resources that you can actually spend on transportation, so what are you going to do? Plus, if you have a network that is falling into a state of, good re of bad repair, and we need to upgrade it, uh, it costs a lot of money. $300 billion over 25 years sounds like a lot, but when you consider everything that's out there in terms of maintaining our bridges, um, our roads, our highway system, our local roads, uh, and the rail and the buses, uh, that money goes fast, especially when you have to put it to maintenance and operating the system that we have. So um, this is sort of a cue for Dave. Um, all I want Dave to do, Dave is the architect of Vital Science. Um, he really is the, is the project manager of this and, and put it all together. I'm just going to ask Dave to quickly sort of get onto the website and show all of you how to use it because this data that I just presented to you, um, we can see it for all types of issues um, all around the region. So I just want to kind of let you know that it's a resource that you can use. So here's Dave. Oh, good morning, everybody. I'll try to keep this quick. I uh, just want to let you know, let's get this up on the screen here. We just want to let you know that Vital Science is not just uh, an analysis that we've done, but it's actually a tool that's available on the web. Is that what's There you go. It's trying to show you the internet. There we go. There it is. All right. So just quickly, uh, this, we've built a tool that allows you to track 36 different issue areas uh, across the Bay Area at all levels, region, county, city, even in your own neighborhood. And so if you just go to the Vital Science website, it's, on, it's available on mobile, tablet, and on your uh, desktop computer. Uh, you can simply uh, choose an indicator that you're interested in. So uh, we have 36 issue areas ranging from tr transportation, land use, economy, environment, all up here. You just click the issue area. I'm going to choose pavement condition here. And for every every uh, every issue area, we track regional trends, and we also have data locally. So here are, we have one interactive as an example. You can see every street uh, across the Bay Area and its current pavement condition. And simply by hovering over it, you can get more data about the current condition of that pavement uh, and in the region. Similarly, you can do, do visualizations of the greenfield results that Matt just showed, zooming in to see when the greenfield development was constructed so you can understand more about those environmental impacts to farmland. And perhaps most, uh, most relevant to Marin here, we have visualizations of sea level rise and where that, that is forecast to happen and the populations at risk of uh, in, uh, uh, sea level rise impacts. Uh, you can actually look at different levels of sea level rise, zoom into your community, and learn more. So I encourage you to check it out. The website is vitalscience.mtc.ca.gov, and I'll be in the corner afterwards. You can feel free to come up and chat with me more about it. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Dave. It's a, it's a fantastic resource, and I encourage you all to, to check it out. There's a lot of information on there. So um, I've been told to kind of move through this uh, quickly so we can have time for Q&A. So I want to talk a little bit about the scenarios. Um, and there's a lot of information up there uh, on the walls about the three scenarios. Uh, we have three um, scenarios that we put together, a sort of magic number. Um, and I want to explain them a little bit uh, to you uh, so that you can understand basically what you're doing. As I mentioned, um, 820,000 uh, new housing units that we need to accommodate across the region somehow uh, in the next 25 years. Um, and we've also got a limited amount of transportation dollars that we can also invest. And so the scenarios um, are a bit different from one another based upon sort of the allocation of people and jobs as well as how we uh, invest uh, that money uh, in transportation. Each scenario does build on the Bay Area's existing land use pattern and transportation network, um, but also taking into account local plans for growth, uh, historical trends, um, and some of these other policy issues. So in terms of the Main Street scenario, that's, that's number one. And essentially what Main Street does is it places most of the growth, um, well, it places the growth really all around the region uh, in most of our cities in town. So in some ways it's the most dispersed growth pattern, if you will, uh, of the three. And you know we do this because we wanna, it's sort of a vision thing. We wanna kind of understand that if we see um, population and jobs dispersed in this way, what that might look like. Connected neighborhoods um, it is a bit different. We, we do see more of the development happening in the so-called priority development areas, which are locally nominated. I think Marin has two of them here, but PDAs take on um, uh, more of the growth in connected neighborhoods. Uh, big cities is, is quite different, and you know, it kind of lives up to its name. The majority of the growth in the big cities uh, scenario occurs in San Francisco, Oakland, uh, in San Jose, and areas uh, around Silicon Valley. In fact, nearly three quarters of the growth uh, in the big cities uh, scenario happens in those places. Um, and, and so that's a bit of a contrast too. And once we kind of allocate that growth, then we have um, a, a certain amount of transportation investment to play with to try to make those scenarios work. Um, and I think it stands to reason that if we're gonna put three quarters of the growth in San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose, then we have to make sure that we can get people into those places and out of those places. So in the big city scenario, there's a major investment uh, in, in, in capital investment and in transit in order to make that happen. You know, one of the things that we see in Main Street's scenario, which is kind of interesting, is that given the limited amount of investment that we have, if we disperse people sort of across the region in a planning sense, um, then our transportation is a bit more limited. We can't spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on transportation. We just don't have the money to make it happen. A lot of the, the resources in Main Streets uh, goes to state of good repair of our local roads and streets. There is a bit of highway, strategic highway expansion and express lanes, uh, more of those concepts in the first scenario, uh, but very little, if any, um, highway expansion in uh, scenarios two and three. So that just kind of gives you a, a snapshot. So these, uh, I have to kind of go quick, but these numbers are all over um, on your board, and, and this is a bit of sort of a focus on Marin. Um, in, in terms of uh, some of the numbers that we're seeing across the scenarios. The no project, you know, what is the no project? Um, I think that, that's kind of a common question that we get. Um, and it really, it just presents a baseline for us uh, to do our evaluation. Um, it, it's essentially a continuation um, of past trends. It's essentially a baseline. Uh, what's also in the no project is basically uh, these discretionary transportation revenues 40 plus billion dollars, we're assuming that those won't be brought to bear. Um, we also assume that we won't do, um, really have that PDA framework and have those developments happening there. So essentially it's, it's a baseline for us to judge our work on. Um, I, I think one thing that you'll notice just in terms of population um, is that in the no project, continuation of past trends, Marin is assumed to take on about 2% of the regional growth. I think it's about 3% of the population today. Um, the three scenarios all fall kind of below that. 17% no project in terms of just total population growth from 2010. And you see the numbers are 15, 16, and 10 respectively across the scenarios. Remember 10, and that's really because big cities, as I mentioned before, three quarters of that growth goes to San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, and Silicon Valley. 
Um, employment, again, sort of similar trends. Nothing too earth-shattering about these scenarios. I think one thing that it's, it's worth to mention is that it's it's pretty tough when you're when you're running these models to really move jobs around. Um, it's not easy to do from a from a policy point of view. Um, employment, in terms of the scenarios, what we're seeing, share of regional growth and growth from 2010. The scenarios don't move the needle all that much um, in terms of these employment numbers. Uh, housing is sort of a similar story, and I know Cynthia went through some of the details in, in, in housing. I, I think it's important to mention on, on the PDA side that um, the growth numbers for Marin in terms of housing countywide are pretty low, 1% share of total regional growth. In terms of where that growth occurs in Marin, and that's that second row, um, what you can see is that in connected neighborhoods, for example, in big cities, nearly half of that growth, so half of that 1%, um, would be projected to occur in those PDAs, which, as I mentioned before, is only a couple places in Marin. Hopefully I'm coming through and making sense. I know this is a lot of numbers and I want to kind of move it along. We've also got some numbers over there on the boards about commute mode, average commute, pavement condition, which, which Dave talked about. Um, just a bit about sort of transportation investments. Again, this is sort of how it lines up. I think I mentioned this before. Big cities uh, sees 38% of the discretionary transportation revenue spent on major projects, uh, a lesser amount on maintenance, where the Main Street scenario, most of it is on maintenance and um, a smaller amount on sort of major capital projects. The targets um, are what we use to evaluate the scenarios. Again, we've got a board over there that kind of walks through them. I think one of the good news, uh, pieces of good news about this plan uh, is that we were able to achieve this statutory 15% per capita GHG target in every scenario. I think we heard earlier that 15% isn't aggressive enough and um, I, I think that as many of our staff, we would say we agree. Um, what this is, though, is the state sort of statutorily um, make sure that we have to, to reach these numbers. So we also see different numbers for, for open space and the urban footprint. Scenarios two and three, there is no development within the urban footprint in either of those scenarios anywhere in the region. Uh, scenario one, that Main Street scenario, is the only one uh, where there is some minor development in some parts of the region. So a bit about project performance, uh, and then I will wrap up and we can open it up for Q&A. Uh, one of the things, another important part of our process is to prioritize uh, transportation capital uh, investments uh, in the plan. And what we focus on mostly, since there are so many transportation projects out there, is that we put a lot of our focus on really big stuff. Um, we look at projects largely that are $100 million or up. Um, or that uh, have a significant uh, expansion of the system. And we uh, evaluate those projects. We look at their costs, we look at their benefits, uh, and we look at some other issues in terms of whether they're achieving some of the targets um, that are aspirational in nature for the region. Uh, some of the North Bay projects that were submitted, um, and, and what this graph is showing on the, on the vertical axis is sort of our benefit cost ratio, okay? And um, the, the stuff that's in purple is predominantly that maintenance stuff that I was talking about. Really getting highway pavement maintenance up to a state of good repair, getting our transit systems up to a state of good repair, and those actually score very well. Um, there is, it, it costs a bit of money to do that, but the benefits for the users of those systems, um, to have roads that are smooth, to have transit systems that are reliable and not delayed and that come on time, um, there's huge benefits towards putting in some of that money to those systems. Some of the other big projects that are sort of in this plan that we're trying to work out the financials for, Marin Sonoma Narrows is a project uh, that's been submitted um, as a benefit cost ratio of over one, and that's good. The benefits exceed the cost, um, so it's a good performer uh, in our system. And uh, again, there, we had some mention of SR37 earlier. Uh, obviously, the Richmond San Rafael Bridge is happening now, and I'm going to mention that in a second. And it's actually one of the slides I want to I want to turn to, which is near term uh, projects that are going on uh, in Marin. And what this is is a is a snapshot of, of projects between 2015 and 2018. So near term, uh, and these are mostly projects that are receiving some amount of federal money. So our agency pretty much has to track all of these projects uh, in terms of what's happening. Um, so you see some of these projects like the San Rafael uh, Richmond Bridge uh, showing up. I think that's a 70, we're trying to find some of the financials 
so I can give you some of that information. Uh, here's. So in terms of we're in some Sonoma Narrows, we've got 65 million uh, programmed in our tip over the next three years for that project. Um, also, uh, interchange corridor improvements, US 101 with Green Gray. Uh, there's a Golden Gate Bridge, a suicide deterrent, safety barrier. We also have money for that. Um, all told, $500 million um, in projects for Marin over the next three or four years, uh, which are going to be receiving federal funds. Um, I just wanted to point that out because there's a lot going on right now, and I'm sure there's, there's frustration all across the region about why we can't do more sooner. And I think as staff, we feel that all the time uh, as well, that we do sort of live also within this uh, fiscal constraint. So please stay involved. Obviously, you're here at the, at the workshop, so you guys are involved. Um, and I just want to put a shout out to that. In September, we're going to be having the preferred scenario. Um, and so we're taking your input now. And I just wanted to thank you all uh, for listening to the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Oops, Matt, please uh, join us at the table. I'm going to ask Brad Paul to come up. There you are, Brad, and get some comments, and then we'll open to questions. So I'm going to be very brief so we can get right to the questions, but I, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Matt lives in San Rafael. I live in San Rafael. Um, we have a number of people at both ABAG and MTC who live in Marin, and that's really important because we love this place. That's why we live here, and we understand how special it is and how easy it would be to mess it up. But we also are seeing creative ways to solve some of the problems that Matt was talking about. I'll give you an example. Tomorrow morning about 7.20, I will be at Johnny's Donuts on 4th Street. Uh, getting some of the best donuts in the region to take home to my family for breakfast. And I've noticed across the street there's a development going on. And it's sort of the polar opposite of Winco. It's a small infill project. It's three stories. It's going to have ground floor retail, two floors of apartments upstairs. There's probably going to be six, eight, I don't know, 12 units up there. But when it's done, you're not going to notice it. It's going to fit right into what's on 4th Street. And it's going to contribute real housing where people can walk across the street to Johnny's Donuts. Um, where people can walk to the Raphael Theater to watch a movie. And as you know, there's more and more people in Marin, single, uh, the statistic I heard a couple of years ago was 40% of all single family homes in Marin have one person living. If we can figure out a way to get more people in those houses, we can come a long way towards solving our longer term housing problem. When I lived up in Green Bay, I had two people on my street leave a single family home. One gentleman died, another one, the, the woman who lived there went to assisted living. And those houses went from having one person in them to a couple with three kids. And that is a way to accept greater density without having to build a lot. The, the house that I just bought in San Rafael has a shed in the back, which the previous owners got grandfathered somehow, so it's legal. Um, it would be possible to convert it to a very small apartment that we could rent to a student. What my wife wants to do in the next few years is actually tear it down and get one of these, their prefab cabins that have a tiny little bathroom, they're kind of like a big studio apartment. And her idea is that my son, when he gets older, so he can keep living here if he wants to, he live there, it would be in our house. And then when we get older, we can move in there and rent our house out and not, not be really poor. But those are the kind of creative things that people in Marin, this group called Lilypad, it's working on this, it's in Marin, it's one of the national models for how we do these smaller houses, accessory dwelling units. Nevada has just passed one of the best laws in the country, not just for accessory dwelling units, but junior bedroom units, which we can talk about later. So we all think of Wind Cup in Marin as sort of what we don't want to do, but there's a lot of creative work going on here about what we do want to do. And there are a number of projects in San Rafael, which has one of the PDAs in Marin and is going to be taking part of that 42% that Matt talked about. But there are lots of small parking lots or one-story buildings that are unoccupied that could be replaced not by a five- or six-story building, not by 50 or 100 units, but a building that fits right in design-wise and provides eight units with retail or 10 units with retail. And there are lots of places to do that. That is a way, I think, that works in Marin the way Wincup didn't. So I'm very optimistic going forward, whichever the scenarios we pick, that we will find a way to make it very Marin-centric for here, for this county, and be able to start creating more housing for our kids, which might be in our backyards, it might be in our basement, it might be down on 4th Street. And for people who want to leave their single-family homes but not leave the community. 
And one of the last things I'll say is that often the State Office of Housing Community Development is kind of a one-size-fits-all operation. And you all that deal with housing elements at Reno, we won't get into that right now, but you know what I'm talking about. And we at ABAG and MTC can help by going to Sacramento and saying, we need to create more flexible ways to implement the housing elements so they work in the individual communities, especially the smaller cities and towns. So with that, I'll stop, and I think we're going to go to questions and answers. Thank you to both Brad and Matt for very good presentations. A lot more can be said on this, but now it's time for your questions on the scenarios or the numbers. And we've got Pat on one side. Yes, we have a question here. If you can stand up and state your name and your question clearly. I just wanted to remind you that all the local governments have already told us how they want to be to grow. Uh, the reason there has only been 55,000 increase in housing in the last five years is because local governments representing their constituents' wishes simply do not want to call that much to the Where there is a jobs increase, this way of Okay, so it starts off with the jobs, all right? The housing and, 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 and everything else follows after that. So I would recommend that you, your housing prediction be based on actual housing permitted over the last five years. What the local governments will actually do. And that you spend all your resources trying to find ways to, di to diversify job increases, in particular, to carriage to get them to, 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 to go to the East Bay instead of the peninsula, and states to punish future job increases where there is no housing to accommodate. Very good. Uh, John, can we have a question on your side? Hi, yeah, uh, Wendy Callens. Um, a, a few things I want to uh, bring up. First of all, I noticed that there is uh, nothing in there that maps out few, where commercial development would go. We talk about housing development, but we know that commercial development, development actually generates more traffic than housing, so I think it's important to recognize where that, if we're looking for a balance, we need to have that in there. I also want to reiterate the need to really break down um, the details of the kind of jobs and the kind of housing. Is it a high paying job, low paying, low paying, same with the housing? Because you could create a whole lot of jobs that are in the service sector and a whole lot of housing with high price and you haven't solved your problem. Um, and then thirdly, on the transportation end of things, I don't see anything in this plan that talks about walkable communities. And if you want to look at the, the baseline, if you're trying to create a situation where you reduce the amount of automobile traffic, it starts with walkability. And the Terra project that was mentioned is a really good example because that one is walkable to Northgate, but you take your life in your hands if you want to get across the Freitas Parkway. So if you're going to put that kind of development, you have to require that it be walkable off-site. And then finally, you talk about capital improvement for transit, but what's really needed for transit to make it efficient and frequent is operations. And I would really like to see some dedicated funding, new funding. I know a lot of money is spent right now on operations, but there is no place in the Bay Area that does not need more money for operations. Thank you. Great, yeah. so I saw Matt nodding his head Well, I think you know. No, I think your your points are, are hugely well taken. I think I think the plan um, really tries to, to talk about walkable, walkable communities in its narrative, and I think that's kind of the genesis of where this PDA concept came about, right? Um, is that you know if we can get some development near transit, people can use that as a first option. If you make transit more attractive to people, and you make walking and biking more attractive to people, uh, that might be one way, not the only way one way to uh, take people um, out of their cars uh, for all those trips. Um, in terms of cost, 
uh, component to them. Uh, so depending on if there's enough resources available, um, I think you could see uh, more of an influx in, in transit operations in this plan. So hopefully that answers your question. Great. And Brad, anything to add on your point? I would just add on the job side, I think you make a very good point, which is that there are cities that want more jobs. What can we do to help them? So cities like Richmond, they're going to build one of the new campuses for UC Berkeley, there, which is going to generate a lot of research jobs. Um, Vallejo is interested in getting more jobs. They're, they have some of the more uh, affordable housing market right there. So part of it is everybody seems to want to be in San Francisco right now in Silicon Valley, but as the prices there get higher and higher, we're starting to see companies moving to the East Bay, so I think that will help over time. And there may be things we can do or policies we can um, support that would help that to happen. Great. Thank you, Pat. I see you have a question. Yeah, um, my name is Bill Carney, and um, since you're looking for feedback, um, it, it seems to me that the, I, I hope that we get the connected neighborhoods version, maybe hybridized a bit with more, uh, more of the transit and greenhouse gas reductions uh, from the other, from the city scenario. Um, that, the reason I'm attracted to that scenario is it gives us the housing that we so badly need and it gets it, gets it in the places where it belongs, which are in walkable uh, communities that are walkable to transit and services uh, in the shopping. So I uh, really would encourage that and very much uh, enjoy Brad's uh, uh, story of the West End development. And just a little footnote on that, it took a lot of work with the Design Review Board in order to prevent uh, cars from going over the sidewalk of Fort Street and really preserve the pedestrian environment that that development contributes to. So sort of that, that brand of level of involvement is really important. Any other ideas you would have about uh, bringing people to our downtown that we really like to hear? So I'm glad to hear the detail of that because it just, again, all of your communities, most of your communities have design review boards or planning departments that look at this. And a lot of times, Developers, especially if they're not from Marin, have sort of a cookie cutter way of doing things. And it's important to let them know what has to change in their typical development to make it work for the community. So I think that's an important piece of this in all of our communities in Marin is to have actively involved residents saying, you can make this project better. I've been doing that starting in San Francisco decades ago. And the good developers appreciate that and are willing to do it because uh, they don't know the community as well as we all do. Um, so I think that's that's really important. The other thing I would say is that often communities wait for a developer to come forward and propose something. And often it's not the right thing. Whereas when you do a plan and you identify in your plan, whether it's the neighborhood level or the city level, where you think development should go, take that extra step and say, what kind of development it should be? Is there a need for assisted living in your community? Is there a need for senior housing? Is there a need for more family housing? And then you'll be surprised there are people in your community who know developers. So you could go to a developer, and what you have to offer is to say, if you build what we want, the way we want it, we'll get people to support your process, or your project throughout the process, which saves time. And often communities don't see that tool out there, but you can get what you want, the way you want it to look, and at the scale you want, if you talk to enough developers and say, this is what we would support in our community, and we're willing to go to the planning commission and the city council to support it, if you want to come forward and support this kind of a project as opposed to picking up the paper and reading about some project that's two or three stories too tall, 50 units too many, because a developer's been working for two years on this and you're just hearing about it now. I would really urge you, if you know developers, to have conversations with them about, them, about projects in your communities that you'd like to see built for seniors, for families, for veterans, uh, and see if you can find somebody that would actually come forward and help you do that. Great, Matt, did you want to no, okay. it? Okay, very good. John, how are you? Hi, Kate Powers. I was just, um, what I think is missing from the three scenarios is how each of them um, have what the environmental, how they achieve environmental goals or environmental impacts, um, not just with like the greenhouse gas emissions in terms of locating the density in big cities or distributing it around main streets, but also how they impact our watersheds. Um, and I, Pat mentioned that watersheds and sea level rise would be addressed. 
I think that's really important that a lot of our um, subdivisions were built in the 50s and 60s when creeks were um, channeled and piped and we're recognizing the value in um, restoring that function. Um, and so I, I would love to see the different scenarios show environmental, um, the environmental impacts of the different scenarios and not wait until the preferred scenario um, with the environmental assessment is done. I think that's kind of important in getting to the assessment. And also I'd see, like to see one more thing is just a, a stronger connection between the priority conservation areas and the priority development areas in the in um, communicating about the planning because I think uh, the priority conservation areas have a lot of um, potential in um, looking at our open spaces and preserving wildlife corridors and by locating development in priority development areas and how how the environmental um, aspects of our um, planning can be um, improved by our transportation alternatives. I think in terms of the uh, watersheds um, it's, it, it's a great question and um, it, it's something that we will be looking at um, when we move on to the EIR process we, we started the EIR for the plan um, by the way and we're, and we're moving into that and actually the the three scenarios that you see along with the preferred are likely to be assessed um, through CEQA where we're looking at all kinds of things um, like that. And the water piece is very important for a number of reasons that you've given, not just because it makes a neighborhood more pleasant place to be and more fun to, to be recreation there, but also can affect sea level rise and flooding. And we have at ABAG a project called the San Francisco Estuary Partnership that goes out and gets grants and, and basically re-grants those to communities around the bay to do um, restoration of wetlands, uh, daylighting creeks that have been in pipes or in concrete troughs for decades. So I would uh, urge you to go on our website to the San Francisco Estuary Partnership to see some examples of that. I grew up on the East Coast in Providence, Rhode Island, which is about 20 miles away, used to have two rivers. In 1860, they buried one of the rivers for the railroads. And about 15, 20 years ago, they dug it up, and they now have two rivers again. It's become a tremendous economic engine for the downtown. They put every 50 feet a place to burn logs at night and they have a thing called water fire. And 50 to 100,000 people show up for arts and entertainment. So it's not just for um, environmental reasons that we can do this, but also for economic reasons for some of our communities. Great. Another question over here? Yes, Sal Dugan. Um, one of the most encouraging things is that you're looking at general plans and doing a comparison with general plans. And I think that's critically important. Jurisdictions spend a lot of time putting general plans together. Can you give me an idea of how the general plan will be weighted against the overall general scenario uh, relative to the allocation? So uh, the scenarios were an exercise of what would things look like if we went all the way to the three big cities of which is scenario three. Or we just let development happen everywhere, but you know, focused around each community's downtown. Um, and in most cases, we took, it, took into consideration the general plans, but in some cases, they kind of pushed the limits of some of those general plans, just to get a sense of what that would do. But for the preferred plan, the only way this plan works is if it's, it's something that the communities believe is, is working for them, because all planning decisions in California are made at the local level. So we would want to change the general plans. We can't change the general plans in this process, and that's not the intention. So what the preferred alternative does is hones very closely to, if not exactly to, the general plan in each community, unless we've heard in your community that you're thinking about changing something. So we might say, okay, we'll, we'll factor that in. But the general plans and your housing elements are the foundation for what we come up with in the plan data. We will have conversations because sometimes you'll look at one of these and say, wait a minute, you can't build on that side, it's not zoned for that. And our model sometimes missed it. Or you will have changed your economic development policy to encourage jobs in an area that previously been zoned residential, you might not know that. So that's the reason at this level, at the preferred scenario level, you need to pay attention both at the city level with your planning departments and your city councils, and also residents in the neighborhoods to see when the preferred alternative comes out, what do we have planned for your community and do a reality check to help us with that. Yeah, I think you know, 
the, the problem that we, I think we face from where I sit is that in order to get that 820,000 number for housing, if we stitch together all of the local general plans, we couldn't do it. And that's just like a fundamental challenge with this work. Um, I, I think what you see up here um, in Marin is, for the most part, I think it's very modest. I mean, there are communities down in Silicon Valley, especially in scenario three, where we are pushing them in a big way in terms of housing growth in order to try to see if we can get some housing close to the jobs. And in some of those places down in Silicon Valley, um, Mountain View, Sunnyvale, places like that, um, we're pushing way beyond, and having conversations with those local communities, by the way, while we're doing it, but, but kind of pushing beyond what might be in their general plan just to try to look through for different numbers. But that, you know, fundamentally, that's one of the things that we just, as staff, have to have to deal with as part of regional planning. So it's not, it's not always easy. John, you uh, very, no, my name is Ann Becker, and I live in Kentfield. You very kindly invited us here to hear about Plan Bay Area and to give you our input. But I noticed that neither the evaluation form nor the comment form ask us which scenario we would recommend. Would you like us to write those in on our forms? I think that would be good. It's a great piece of information for us to have. Again, I think we, we don't like to always portray the scenarios as a competition among the three. Um, we're working towards a preferred, better data and information. We want it to be sort of a blend of the best elements of the three. That's aspirationally what we hope. Um, but I think, of course, we'd be interested if there was one that just shines and for you, then I think we'd be interested in knowing that. And I think toward that end, if, you, if, you, if you're going to do that, if you could just say what it is about option three or scenario three or scenario one that you like in particular, then we can highlight that as well. That would be helpful. Over here. Um, my name is Carol Sheeran. I live in North San Rafael, near Las Colinas and Lucas Valley Road in the city limits of San Rafael. I recently attended the meeting about the uh, Northgate Walk development of 182 units that proposed for uh, on Freitas Parkway in Terra Linda. I noticed that there are one and a third parking places for each unit there. And it is supposedly built near transit and everything. But there doesn't seem to be a way to make sure that these places built near transit are going to be used by the people who live in them. So I, I don't have an answer to this. But I think that's something that you said you were building them near transit, but what makes it, you know people use them? You have no control over who moves into these places. And if they move from Sonoma County down to Freitas Parkway to be nearer their job, they're also now nearer to San Francisco and could choose that they get a higher paying job in San Francisco with a lesser commute. So it's a, it's a big problem. But I'd also like to ask you, do either one of you use public transportation to go to your jobs or do you use public transportation at all at any time in your lives? <laughs> Uh, I ride trains every day. I, I ride my bike to the Larkspur Ferry and go to work that way. Uh, Tom, Mark, Tom, every day. That's where I am. I, I can't claim that I do as well as Matt does because my wife drives my son to school and then drops me off at the Larkspur Ferry on the way there. So we don't not use a car, but we only use one car instead of two. So I take the ferry. And I walk to our office. We have a great new office in San Francisco. It's about a seven-minute walk from the ferry. I used to have to take the ferry and then go take BART to Lake Merritt BART Station. So I save a lot of time and seven dollars a day on BART. Right, but I don't spend that. Hi, Jory Buck in the um, Mill Valley. It's, it's clear that you've got a really engaged audience. It's clear that you have a really engaged audience here, which I think is exciting, and I've enjoyed the presentation. Um, and Dr. Cole's attempts notwithstanding, I didn't really understand the methodology that fuels this 820,000 increase in the Bay Area. But it's clear that all of these scenarios and all of what you're doing is predicated on an increase of almost a million people in the Bay Area over the next 25 years. My question to you is, I don't know what, why there aren't confidence limits on the methodology. So if you say the population growth is going to go up 20% or whatever, how, how much can that be off, I guess? Can that be off by 10%? Can that be off by 15%? So scientific things have confidence levels. There's some sort of, 
it seems to be almost um, sense that the methodology is scientific, but it seems to me that it's rather more pseudo-scientific. My, my, question, my question to you is, of the three scenarios, if you look at, your, if you look at European cities, I'm not an urban planner, if you look at your Western European cities and Western Europe in general, have they, which model do they form? Do they, are they closer to a big city scenario, or are they closer to something that's more dispersed? Well, in, in, in terms of the of the four, and I don't want to speak for Cynthia. I, I, I know I know that Cynthia, in terms of putting together those forecasts, I know it was a ton of work. I'm sure that Cynthia has the confidence intervals in her head. Um, I also know that she worked with uh, some pretty esteemed people who challenged her uh, on that. Economists uh, knew a lot about this subject, and I know that she also looks at the best uh, information that's out there to judge against. So again, I don't want to speak for her, but I think you know, I, I'm pretty confident in what I've seen um, that the work is, is pretty good. You know, European cities, um, you know, I, I don't know where, where to start. I mean, I, I guess I, I was in um, Germany about eight, ten years ago and then traveling in the Berlin area and kind of looking at sort of the differences there. I think it's, 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 a, bit of a, it's a bit of a mix. I, I think you see in, in some of the European cities um, sort of suburban life um, is much different in a lot of those places. Um, I think in, in some of those places you do see um, more of a compact development. You have a lot of resources for um, for high speed transit to get people um, where they want to go. Um, and you know a lot of the European cities that I've been in um, have been uh, extremely dense um, downtown. But also with that um, really sort of that incredible transit infrastructure and bike and walk infrastructure. Um, that really get people where they want to go. So I mean, there's just been that commitment over over time uh, to transit. Yeah, I would just say that I mean I haven't been in that many European cities, but they run the gamut of fairly dense center city cities to places that look like the East Bay. Um, but on the question of um, forecasting, I think what I love about the work that Cynthia does is she never stands up and says this is the number, and she even jokes about. It. She says, this is our best guess right now. But is it worth even making a guess? And really what forecasting is about is trying to imagine what the future could look like with different sets of policies and different sets of, of goals. And what we do to protect the area and protect ourselves is we keep doing this. We don't do one set of numbers or one forecast, as Cynthia said, and say, OK, we're good for five years. There's constantly, every two years, every four years, a very in-depth look at what do we know there are things we're hearing anecdotally right now that may be true in two years, but we don't know yet. But in two years, we will know. And if I had to guess, and this is just me talking, not ABEC, one of two things is going to happen. The economy is going to keep going like this. But if it does, this straight line is going to start to bend because it gets so expensive for people to both live here and work here that people will make other decisions to go to different places, either other parts of the region or other regions of the country. Or we'll have a slowdown, in which case that line will go down a little bit. But I think, as, as, um, as Cynthia said, we've been kind of way off in the past. But the last set of numbers we ran in 2013 is the closest to the long-term trend line, which to me means we're getting better at this. It's not perfect. But I think uh, if Cynthia were up here, she would say that there is no one answer. There's, there's a range of numbers. And we keep doing this so that we keep informing you and the jurisdictions that we're in and what our Best guesses. I see you're coming up here. Cynthia's <laughs> <laughs> like, these are not good answers. I hope you to criticize my answer. Those are great answers, and I appreciate you're both defending my methodology. I just wanted to mention that um, there is a technical report on our forecast. It does describe some alternative projections, and it's available on our website. Pat, yes. Just a quick question. Um, my name is Kathy Schaefer, and um, I want to thank you for hosting this, and thanks for all your comments and your terms. Um, kind of playing off the previous uh, conversation about you uh, taking transit. How many times before you moved, your offices moved uh, from downtown Oakland, did you ask yourself, why is it there is only one bus an hour that goes anywhere from Marin to anywhere in East Bay why do I have to go to 
San Francisco to make it to Oakland. That's just a quick, and then just a comment, a quick comment. I just want to remind you as you're thinking about these things, homes that flood are neither safe, sanitary, nor affordable. The majority of the priority development areas that you've listed are in fact in climatic floodplains today. And just as an example, Marin County currently spends over $10 million a year in flood insurance. That's just Marin County alone. Yeah. Back to, back to commuting. I, you know, I, I think serve my own commuting. Um, you know, I, I think certainly um, I service frequency <clears throat> for things like Golden Gate buses, um, you know, out of the San Rafael Transit Center. Uh, certainly for somebody doing that trip, um, it's it, it's frustrating. I think part of it is the service, some of it is the reliability of the service too, um, and, and that's certainly something that I've uh, that I've experienced personally. And for the first two years that I worked at ADAG in the Oakland office, I drove. And the good news was I was going against the traffic because the, most of the traffic is coming in the morning in the morning and going out at night. So at least I had that. But it was still miserable. The maze, you know, starting with Berkeley, Emeryville. And so I just said, how much time am I spending doing this? Like an hour. And for the same amount of time, I could take the ferry from Larkspur Landing to downtown San Francisco, walk across the street, get on a bar, and take bar to Lake Merritt Park Station. And I could work on my computer, I could read a book, I could listen to music. So. It's, a, it's there's no direct, I mean, there should be more direct buses, but I think more and more people are getting sick of driving, and some people will do what I did, and some people will wait for better bus connections. Thank you, we have one last question. Just made it under the line. Hi, my name is Ken King. Um, oh, thanks. My name is Ken King, I've been a long time resident of Marin 63. I was a uh, plan to what Gary Gaynor was the head of ABAG, so I have some perspective on how things have been in the Bay Area. One, the job growth has, has been astronomical in terms, and the housing, of course, has not kept up. And one the transportation. If the transportation had kept up, the housing wouldn't have been an issue. Then we, we go to Marin. Marin used to be a bedroom committee, com, uh, community when I arrived here. The population of Marin has not significantly changed since the 60s. As everybody knows, yet the transportation problem has at least doubled, if not tripled. And then the question is, why? And the answers are, it can't be the housing. The difference, the basic difference has been two things. One, Marin has imported lots of commercial development. The second thing is, the income level of Marin has drastically changed. So in other words, if it was just a bedroom community, people either worked in Marin, and that wasn't an issue because you had plumbers, teachers, whatever, and Marin was very self-sustaining in that way, but the hiring jobs were in the city. But people just saw the congestion of the city, they moved to Marin. And what happens is, if you have a little more money, you then would like services that you had in the city, but you no longer have to go there anymore. So we imported an enormous amount of business. Of course, that was also had a lot to do with Prop 13 because the cities were not being sustainable without that yes, increases. Yes. And, yes. and so we had this conundrum, with, and we didn't build any more transportation. So each time, as you know, there's a metric. As your income level goes up, the number of transportation things go up. And it comes between two cars, and saying it's five and six as your income goes up. Up because it's not only family, it's the services you have to look for. And we are not addressing A, the transportation, which would solve some of this. And we know in the summertime, the problem with transportation goes down because people aren't driving their kids to school. And in That's some cases, family point. driving to two places. So how are we going to address the transportation issue first? And then the idea of housing, which we desperately need, which I'm not against at all, and get that balance before we start importing more and more businesses that will only clog our streets even further. I grew up in New York City. We didn't have a identity problem. We grew up with it. Oh, we grew up with transportation as well. Good point. Good point. But I think two things to the transportation side. I think uh, on the revenue side, we need more. Um, and I think we're exploring some ways to do that in the plan. I mean, some of our big transportation revenue sources, like the gas tax, 
have lost their purchasing power over years, over the years in a dramatic way. They just don't do what they used to um, before. And so we have to think about it as this, this region has done a great job and the counties have done a great job in sort of bolstering that um, with their own uh, tax measures. Um, you know, we also have to think about the fact that when we build new capital investment that we have to operate and we have to maintain it down the line. Um, and so those bills come due. And the, only, the last thing that I'll just add about that is some of it is the money, but some of it is also just making better decisions um, with the money that we do have. And that's really where we, we start talking about the idea of doing performance-based um, decision-making. And in the plan, um, we try to do that for really big projects. We take a look at their benefits versus costs. And because we kind of move through, we have to sort of um, do that with all of our transportation decisions to make sure that they're performance-based so they're prioritized because we can't um, literally do every project. Great. I want to thank our presenters for this section, Matt Maloney and MPC, and Matt Paul. And I'd like to invite Alex Bachelman back to the front, and Pat's going to lead us in our wrap-up. I think Alex had a, um, she had a child care. Oh, she did. Okay. okay. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, it's fantastic that you've had an opportunity to see the open house, be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the staff at MTC and ABED, and then have an opportunity to hear the presentations and ask questions and answers. Um, the um, RIN ABED delegates and alternates, we will be getting together and um, discussing um, the next workshop. It'll be either a late 2016 or early 2017, uh, but we'll want to do something similar to be able to get your input. It's really important to fill out those evaluation sheets, help us to make these workshops and open houses even more effective as we go from year to year. Um, if you want um, to get copies of all the slides and all the presentations, you're going to need to make sure that you registered when you came in with a clear email. I will be sending out um, a link to all the presentations to those people who signed up at the registration desk in the um, foyer with a clear email that we can read. I also wanted to mention that the handouts that you were given at the foyer in the beginning um, um, are ones that really lended itself to the discussions and each of the individual stations, which will remain open until 1 o'clock, um, have also some additional handouts. So be sure if you're interested in any particular aspect of Plan Bay Area to get those particular handouts from that station. Um, I also um, wanted to remind you that in September, ABAG and MTC will be selecting the preferred scenario which will be evaluated in the environmental document. And then at the first part of the year in 2017, um, we'll have a draft a plan and environmental impact report that will be subject to public comment and uh, we'll have a workshop and uh, open house and the, on that as well here in Wright County. Um, and it's going to be set up for adoption sometime in July of 2017. Um, I wanted to thank all the elected officials for coming, um, the ABAG delegates and alternates as well as those members of the Transportation Authority RIN. Especially a big shout out to uh, Catalina of MTC and Wally Charles from um, ABAG and all the ABAG and MTC staff. Let's do a round of applause for them. Fantastic. So we actually have five or minutes and we're going to open up for general questions. Um, Stephanie's going to um, take questions over on this side. John, hopefully you still have your microphone and you'll be able to um, do questions on this side, so. Pat, can I interrupt for one moment, please? Yes. Um, can we please express um, our gratitude to Pat Eklund? I, I can't tell you how much work she has done. And if we might just take one second, I, I almost want us to close our eyes and reflect back on where we were in 2013. Um, due to a fabulous partnership between, really guided by Pat and Brad, I would say that um, we are in an entirely different place right now. Um, I want to just thank MTC and uh, ABAC for coming together, and especially under Pat's guidance, we're in a whole new place, and um, I 
think we should all be hopeful about where we're going uh, forward. So thank you. Thank you. So in light of Renee's comment, I wonder if you can comment on what's happening with ABAG and MTC and what's happening with the merger and how that's going. And also, Brad, really appreciating your comments about local control and the way in which people in communities could be talking to developers, but putting that up next against uh, Jerry Brown's statement about giving even more rights to develop to developers. Um, I'm going to answer that question about the ABAC MTC um, relationship. As you know, MTC decided um, last year not to fully fund ABAC um, unless we um, uh, agreed to do a implementation action plan. Um, the ABAC General Assembly met on May 19 um, and passed a, um, a vote to recommend options four, which is one agency. Uh, for land use and transportation planning, which is also a, uh, would be the MPO, ABAC and MTC go away, that's option four. Option seven um, was the option where ABAC staff is then transitioned into MTC, the ABAC executive board and the council of governments would remain, and the MTC commission would remain, and at some point in the future, um, the agent, the regional agencies would consider or pursue um, a future governance or organization. Uh, the ABAG Executive Board passed something similar, but all the principles are focused on um, option seven. Um, that uh, resolution I'd be glad to include in the link um, to uh, this session. MTC in, on May 25th. Uh, did pass um, option seven, um, and they have uh, directed uh, their staff and to work with the ABAC staff on an implementation action plan, which will be adopted by both agencies in June. Um, and I am in the process of working together with the Red ABAC delegates um, and alternates on our comments on the implementation action plan, which we'll be sending to ABAC and MTC. So that's sort of where we are. Brad or uh, Matt, did you want to add anything? This is very extremely political, but uh, Brad? I, I will, uh, I'm going to get to your second question about the governor's policy. I'll just say that I think Pat laid out what's happened. I will just say personally that I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to figure this out and come to a better place than we've been for a while. Um, but I think we'll know a lot more in two months, and four months, and six months. And so the thing that um, some of you have heard about ABAC delegates, the way ABAG is organized is every city, every one of the 101 cities, and every one of the nine counties has the ability to send one delegate to our General Assembly, and that's our governing body. We meet, we used to meet once a year. Um, we started doing meetings in each of the counties at least once a year to get more feedback besides our general meeting. And in Marin, uh, after the last Plan Bay area, Pat decided to convene the delegates like every three months on average. Yeah. I, I have a, um, uh, yeah, definitely, I'm so, a past master, definitely. So, and because I live here, I come to meetings, I'm when I'm invited, and we have these great discussions. And so every one of the 11 cities is represented by Pat on our executive board, which is a smaller body of 38. And Matt Damon, Supervisor Damon, um, excuse me. Content. Damon Conner. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the physical resemblance. It's the physical resemblance. Uh, Supervisor Damon Conley. Uh, represents the county board. So you have two really strong representatives on our governing board, but every one of your delegates from the 11 cities meets regularly and helps inform us. And so I think as this process goes forward, as in terms of the merger, you're going to be involved in that discussion and help us work that out so we come to a good conclusion. Yes. On the governor's piece, um, I'm going to, because I'm on camera, I'm going to be very careful in what I say about our governor. But I would say that um, housing in general and affordable housing been one of his great interests starting from uh, a number of years ago, particularly affordable housing. Um, I'm going to be on a conference call uh, early this week to learn more about that proposal, but the way it's been portrayed in the media at least is that it's a way to um, 
streamline the approval process and make things as of right that aren't. There may be a few cases where that would be helpful to all parties involved, but it may also undermine local control over land use and planning. So we at ABAG are, st I just got a, a, a memo from one of our staff people last night, I haven't read it yet. So I don't want to comment on something I'm not really familiar with, but we will pay a lot of attention to that because it needs to be helpful and not undermine efforts like Plan Bay Area, which is to get the local communities involved in this effort to do more in the area of housing, economic development, open space, all the things we make, not just our region, but every region of California, a better place for its residents and businesses. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question on this side, and then John, your question will be the last. Uh, Kevin Lindquist, uh, in terms of forecasting, you were uh, worried about um, things going forward, and I see that climate is one of your big uh, operations. Uh, the 15% reduction, well, good news. Um, there is a latest uh, info out from NOAA that there uh, no level, uh, no acceleration in sea level rise. It was a comprehensive study over 200 sites, both coasts and that, and that equates to seven inches um, in a century. So do not believe the exaggerated two feet, five feet uh, scenarios that were out there. And the other thing is that uh, carbon dioxide, which you are blaming uh, as a greenhouse gas, uh, is the water vapor is the main greenhouse gas, and green uh, CO2 is a plant food, and another nice report from Landsat satellites, it's greening the north with the increased carbon dioxide. Thank you. Great, if we can make sure we get those comments um, and captured, Amy, that would be great. John, um, your question is the last. Yeah, my question is, I'm a general contractor, my name is Craig Gates, and I used to be an advisor with MTC for about 14 years, representing Marin. One of the big things that none of you have ever addressed is infill housing. There is so much vacant commercial property here, and infill housing will not affect the EIRs because you've already had the people living there, working there, public transportation is there, water usage is already there, electrical, so everything is already there. It's a perfect environment. I've done infill housing in San Francisco. Another example you should go look at, not Europe, you need to go look at Hong Kong. 80% of Hong Kong is affordable housing. 80% of Hong Kong is provided by the government there. It was developed by the English government before he turned it back over to the Chinese government after the contract, and that was 1997, July. And like again, I said, 80%. So that's 12 million people in a condensed area. That's a great place to learn from. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for your last two comments. Again, I want to thank you all very much for coming. Stay tuned for more public workshops and open houses on this issue as we move forward. Again, thank you to our speakers and to all the elected officials for being engaged in this process. And um, just thank you very much for staying engaged. Uh, and enjoy the open house.